let's say hey, here, let's arms up if you can hear me. Everybody go woo woo! All right, we are going to start in just about a minute or so. Okay, we have fantastic sound crew here today. Is that better? Or is it still feeding? Sounds a little thin. Maybe because I'm too close to speaking. Okay, is that better? Yeah, less tinny. Well, uh, okay, everybody. We're going to start here in about a minute or so. I just want to say welcome to Word Crawl 2018! Now, wait, now, wait a second. Let's get some enthusiasm going here. Word Crawl 2018! Woo! All right, that's a lot better. Because listen, if you're going to stay with us most of the day, you're going to need that enthusiasm to last. So let me introduce myself. My name is Bruce Cohen. I am currently the board president on the Festival of Words. Word Crawl is our annual fundraiser, and this is the fifth year of Word Crawl. Fifth year. And this was dreamt up a couple uh, five years ago by uh, people involved in Festival Awards um, as a fundraiser, and also to to emphasize how important Festival Awards is, and to talk about Festival Awards as well. Um, and uh, this year we have over 50 wordsmiths. Do you believe that? 50 wordsmiths from now till midnight or 11.30ish. Um, we have six venues, um, all up and down Jefferson Street. We try to, it's a crawl, so we try to make it a journey for y'all. And uh, we're starting here with this, uh, thank you again to Rick and Carpe Diem. Thank you, Rick. Carpe Diem has always been in our corner, and we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. And what a great spot to start off with. Um, so if, if you are planning to hang out for a portion of the day or whatever, we have maps available. We have maps. We have merch available. The maps show you exactly where we're going to be. Each venue we spend at least an hour and a half at and then a half an hour between venues so you can get to the next place and i just want to tell you after we finish up here we are going to have an all french version mr jambon back there and horace tron and a whole bunch of other french artists and that's going to be in a new area this year uh, where solo violins is at uh, corner of east vermilion in jefferson in the atrium that's where we're going to be but that's right after we leave here and that's a, that's a new spot for us this year so that's and that's all going to be in french and that that will be very very exciting so please join us from there so um i just want to say thank you for coming out and participating and supporting word crawl and by supporting work or you're supporting festival awards again we have merchandise over here we have hats we have a bucket that will be passed around so please uh, kindly show your support monetarily if you wish and uh, for the performers i just want to note that alex sitting in sort of catty corner for me raise your hand alex alex is our timer so you the way the fundraiser works for those who don't oh, this is their first time is that performers or wordsmiths, as we like to call them, get 10 minutes of performance time. And for those 10 minutes, they raise um, $100 or more, depending on how great a fundraiser they are. Um, and, but they have to at least $100 for their 10 minutes. And all that money goes directly to the festival awards. So we can bring in unbelievable authors. And this year, we have three unbelievable authors. Uh, po uh, authors and poets that are attending festival awards. We can talk about that later. But I want to get the ball rolling. So, um, so that's kind of how Word Crawl works. It's, it's really a fundraiser for the festival awards. But it's also a literary event to get out 
this incredible wealth of talent that we have right here in Acadiana. Uh, um, literary talent. And, and it's all for you. So thank you so much for coming out. So let's start, let's, let's kick this thing off. And we'll kick it off right. And our first performer is Carol Rice. Okay? Let me just say a few things about Carol. First of all, Carol is a good friend of mine. All right, Carol? Yeah, and she's a poet, all in caps. Um, she has many great things, including a Midwesterner, a businessman, a business person, entrepreneur, sailor to the South Pacific, teacher of world religions, mother of three grown men, and a horse trainer. So, Carol, take it away. Sounds better than an old prone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, I got here early, and there was no one here. And I said, wow, we're not going to make any money today. But here we are, and it's so beautiful to see everyone, see everyone again, and remember all the five uh, different festival words we've had, and all I learned at those festivals from the poets and writers that came from the workshops, from the listening to all the teenagers read their poetry out on the parking lot over there in Grand Coteau. It's really been wonderful and it's been a, a totally growing experience for me because I, I was afraid to read in public before. Now, I love it. I got addicted to it. So, I brought my little book here because I finally got it published and then I got it republished. And if anyone wants to buy it, I'm reducing the price today to only $5, which you have to donate to the Festival of Words. <laughs> and did my time start, or is it already over when I'm blabbing away? <laughs> okay. Here's the first poem I ever wrote driving down I-49 towards Lafayette. Nothing is cruel about April's promising sun, budding hopes, palest vibrant greens. A heart with hope lives even in ages of ice. Summer, like death, is inevitable. I say, choose spring. is there but gray. Well, as long as we are in deep water, we are safe. But the foghorns start to sound. And we know the foghorns are near the land to ward us off. And we crank up the motor and steer away from the sound. I would not want to be there ever again. Suddenly we realize there is another sound and more waves. I am afraid. Our enemy is not water or lack of sight. Our enemy is rock and sand. We can steer, but which way is the way? The waves get higher. That means we are closer to disaster and then. Well, maybe this son of Ben would like to be a little 
so about things, you know. I was telling someone earlier, he says, how are you doing? I said, I'm very mad at getting old, but otherwise things are good. Sure. <laughs> of that. This is a poem called The Pear Tree. Well, it might be. <clears throat> new, a new place to live. It has a back porch, four acres. I'm alone with one dog and four horses. So, I, who have lost part of myself, I am drying up and failing to give fruit. I sit in sunshine that morning, enjoying the last crumbs of breakfast. In the night, a heavy limb blew off my pear tree. It hit the fence and hung there, still slightly attached to the trunk. It lay there and I waited for my yard man to come and remove it but he did not come. The tree, in time, put out its spring buds, and so, so did I. The nearly severed branch, the broken branch, not knowing it was dying, put out buds too. Days passed and flowers appeared on the branch. Even as it was edging out of life, it bloomed. It seemed blissfully unaware that to me it was already dead and on the fire heap. It grew as gracefully as spring, and I felt sad that the old tree was falling to pieces and sad the branch would uh, cease to bear fruit. In time, the man arrived, cut the little bark that had been holding the branch to its source. It fell in the pasture and was burned. But I, who had glumly realized how much of me has died already, suddenly felt free and young. And it left me only sun warmed in spring days and waiting for the guard man just blooming and blooming. going to be called something like uh, Near Death is Near Life, part two of the autobiography of a plankton. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. Everything I do is didactic. <laughs> you know, life and death, God and earth, and you know, that's it. Near death is nearest life. Some living is more like death. But when I was drowning, I knew how precious life is. I just wanted to get up the next morning, stretch, pet the dog, and have that first delicious sip of coffee. Another time, I was sliding off the road in a car flying at 60 miles an hour. I was thinking then about death. I was curious. Then the car flew off, hit a soft bank, and all we had was problems. Dark night, horn blaring, then running to save us. Life, I decided, is about the fun of having problems to solve. I think I'll stop that one there, but I forgot. Bring the second page. <laughs> this poem. I know you would like this. A pale coral rose. Fragrant cloud, they call it. It sprinkles its aura lavishly across the grass. It smells all the way to the house. I have watered it myself. I would describe it to you if I had the art to do so. But alas, it died in the early freeze last fall. I have covered it with horseshit. Perhaps if you stay until spring, you will have a chance to see it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Festival of Words. Put that on the table so we can make more money for the festival. <laughs>
everybody hear me? Yeah. I'll do it without the microphone. The reason why that I'm sitting is because I have a bad right leg. So if I put pressure on it, it hurts a little bit. So that's why I'm sitting. But I can see on my eye level with all you. So I feel like I'm a part of the crowd. <laughs> Poetry of Us, the Poetry of the U.S. And my poem uh, is in, of course, the Louisiana section. Um, it's called Louisiana Bayou Song, but I just love the way Anna illustrated that with the dancing hair. It's just hilarious. Sometimes on the bayou in Louisiana, a storm rolls in quickly. Cypress trees sway to the sound. Sometimes on a quiet day when the sun is high and hot, a heron happens by. The bayou slows to the beat of his waiting. 
The song of the bayou can be as fast and frenetic as the Zydeco two-step, or as soft and slow as the Cajun waltz. The bayou sings a song to me. This, um, this poem is called The Nutrient Blues. I know from living around, living around here, you kind of know a little bit about the nutria and how they're an invasive species. Nutria, nutria, new tree, uh. You invaded our fragile wetlands with your bright orange tusks and your whip-like tail. You look like an overgrown rat. Nutria, nutria, new tree, uh. South American soldier cadet with your grand appetite for all things green. Watch out, you're going to get fat. Nutria, nutria, new tree, uh. A bounty on your pelt with shaggy brown fur and a soft undergrowth. You're, un you're likely to be made into a hat. <laughs> This one is Bard Owl. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Five minutes. Okay, then I won't go into the long story about the Bard Owl, but my neighbor actually um, found a, a owling, a little one, and placed it into a box in her tree and kind of saved the life of this owl. And a mother owl was there. It was just an amazing story. But the barred owl is an owl we hear quite often on the bayou. <coughs> Mr. Owl hoots a call. Who cooks for you all? Soulful eyes from hollow spies. Moon rises, forest disguises. Shadows dance, bayou's trance. Marking mole, mouse, or bowl. Barred wings hover, strong talons cover. Noiseless flight, deep, dark night. <laughs> this summer, I started working on a new um, collection. And this one is, um, I was actually asked by historian and um, she's a, a retired UL professor, Phoebe Hayes, who lives in Liberia, and she is working on um, some genealogy and research that has to do with the physicians, the African American physicians that lived in New Liberia. And one of them is Emma Wakefield, and Emma Wakefield actually was the first African American female to receive um, a medical degree. And she received her degree in 1898. Um, and so Phoebe asked me to write this biography and poems about Emma Wakefield. And I told her I was the wrong color. But she said, do it anyway. So one of the things that, um, that has helped me a lot in, in this pursuit is to find inspiration from other African-American writers. And this one comes from a new book. It's just out called We Walk, Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices that is edited by Wade Hudson and Cheryl Willis Hudson. And um, it's after Rita Williams Garcia called We the People. We the people lift our voices, carry them forth, speak of freedom. We, the people, appreciate our minds, take steps toward the dream, invite others in. We, the people, reject ignorance, question prejudice, protect our rights. Daddy, are we the people? Little black girls like me? Proud black boys like my brothers? Are we the people? Yes, my child, all of us, not some of us, we are the people, you and I, your brothers, your sisters, your teacher, our preacher, and all the singing voices of the choir. We are the people. Some of you 
you may be familiar with the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley. And um, one of the things that I like to do is to kind of play with someone else's form and someone else's idea and then create it into my own. And this one, um, the Invictus, really inspired a poem in this collection about Emma Wakefield. Um, for the death, it was for the death of her sister, Mary Victoria, in San Francisco of, epilep of epilepsy at the age of 26. Out of the grief that burdens me, dark as the night without a moon, I thank poets of history for setting down my endless tomb. In wake of Victoria's song, her heart too young to overcome. Under these losses, I am strong. My head is bowed, I won't succumb. Beyond the seizures of her time, awaits a cure I long to find. And I honor her life sublime, by heartbeat strength into my mind. It matters not how steep or wide, how charged the epileptic toll. I am a rower of the tide, I am a sower of my soul. Because I'm going to read the last poem in this collection called um, I Know Who I Am, and this was inspired by Ernest Gaines, which is um, from Voices from Louisiana by Ann Doby, and she um, has this, this wonderful quote from Ernest Gaines about I know who I am, and I just stole it, so. Steal like an artist, right? I know who I am. I was born during Reconstruction in a newly formed Iberia parish. I know about growing up on the bayou. I know about enslaved sacrifices. I know education is survival. I know all these things about myself. I know what I care about. I know I care about the body, how it works, how it heals, how it lives. I know I reject white vigilantes. They, in their hatred, trespass, terrorize, and discard dignity. I know not all whites are evil. I know not all blacks are kind. I know why my work is important. I speak love. I hold new life in my hands. I rise. I know. I know who I am. Thank you. quality time together. This experience has led to a lot of soul searching, you might say, and some of that comes out, I guess, across these pages. The first piece I call Grace. I feel myself circling, circling within a definite pattern of holding, holding the space that encircles Jim and me, holding the role that I play in support of another whose physical body is diminishing by increments, holding my breath at the pattern reverse, and the vital nature of Jim's essential self takes hold upon the material plane once more. Jim does not spend time wishing or wanting for such a miracle to occur. Instead, he spends his days in holding of gratitude for the abundance he notes all around. There are times when I nudge him. What if you were to imagine yourself as already healed? Encourage him to visualize the outcome of strength. To pray with both his heart and his mind's eye that he'll stand up and walk, run even, right out the front door on a beautiful afternoon, sun gleaming on golden brown shoulders, agile feet pounding the pavement from home to Arnoville and back home again. 
just as he always did. He smiles at me, but he withholds commitment. <clears throat> Only says that he's not sure that a focusing towards such an outcome is the work that he should do. Not sure he can assume that he knows better than the learning that he's granted every day. The gift contained in what already is. He'd rather take the seeds of knowing granted by his own acceptance of what is, feel the gratitude for the right where we are, for the inner spaces forming something new, something that is yet to be otherworldly, knowing that the bounty of life is within every moment right now, if we but open our eyes to see. This piece was inspired by a reading I heard by David White. And the quote was, something ignited in my soul, fever on unremembered wings, and suddenly I saw the heavens unfasten and opened. And I call it an eternal exchange. These unremembered wings tucked around me as I come into this world, spitting, coughing, blinking, amniotic fluid, wet lashes, eyes closed to light, crown wide open to cord of vital life force, extending from heavens down through the center of my being. How long in this world of time does it take for wings to dissolve, to dissipate into the murk of slowing vibrations, to become grounded and earthly? How much time passes before the protective cloak recedes. The birth, <clears throat> the birth petals fall away, allowing the human to merge into being. Metaphorical as they are, there's nothing intangible about the places these wings take me still after 60 years, buoyant of heart, ears crackling with snaps and pulses, electric, breath quickening, crown opening to feed once again on the shaft of golden light even while emanating in return a beaming exuberance of reciprocity sent forward upward and equal exchange something ignited that has not been forgotten <clears throat> only tucked away in quiet recesses until conditions call my heart to open once again drawing down the frequency of god into the density of matter an infinite interplay between worlds. <clears throat> I call this angel time. Now is an angel time. Of that I have no doubt. The angelic influences that circle in are more numerous than I can recount individually but in combination they bring about a heightened quality of experience that seems to beget also a heightened awareness of the magic in my life the largest influence of course is my husband jim who continues to receive from his ability to speak struggling sometimes to pull up words for the simplest dialogue that wasn't always the case of course and even now the sharpness of his brain is no different than when it carried me along in conversations across coffee house tables, talking issues of politics or religion, or the places we could travel, or in the early mornings when we'd burn sage and maybe read aloud from Rumi and have a prayer for the coming day, or even late at night when in the darkness I could bear my soul to him over some problem or imagine slight I had received having left me anxious or insecure. He was thoughtful and reflective, talking me through it in a way that left me widened somehow. Or maybe he turned his razor sharp sense of humor in my direction, making me smile and reminding me in his own way, you just piling up shit in your head. <laughs> we still share these understandings just without all the words. Mostly rudimentary pleasantries are expression of needs. Some days his voice works a little better. Other days it's difficult to understand what he's saying except 
knowing him as I do, I can anticipate what he would say in many instances, even before he says it, or discern the somewhat garbled or denuded language by slowing down my hearing to a pace that joins with his. I listen for the basic sounds and tune out the slurring that comes when neurons stop speaking to muscles in ways that would allow for the formation of sharp, clear sounds. So his ability to think is the same, but his body has changed. These long legs that twice ran the Boston Marathon or cycled from Cecilia to Sunset no longer gracefully take him up and out of his chair, it's true. But he never looks at that, not out loud anyway. He only looks for the gifts and he finds them every day. In the Saturday morning fiddler who stepped down off the bandstand to help him with help him to a table, or the countless strangers who see him coming and get up to hold the door so that he can pull inside. And you know, there have been several times over these last five years where Jim and I have looked at each other and one of us has said aloud that right now is a time we feel happier than we've ever felt in our lives. It's not that I would choose these experiences that we're having, nor certainly would he. It's just that in it we are living them. There's so much joy that we're discovering in our relationship, in the intimacy of our connection, in the necessity to live each moment as it arises, knowing that time is finite and treasuring each moment as it comes. The now moment is where this experience forces you to be. There's so much that humans take for granted, I guess, and it's this awareness that is the greatest gift of all, that in the face of loss, one may come to realize that there's so much yet that still remains, so much life to be lived and experienced. One comes to see that every moment by moment, every act, each lifting of the hand or moving up onto our feet is sacred. I'm not sure of what an angel might be or how to conceive of other people's notions of the angelic realm, but for me, I imbue it with a sense of that which is divine, that which moves in ways beyond my brain's capacity for knowing. It brings with it instead a knowing of the heart and the emotions, bringing me to open and accept and stand ready for each day, each passing gift arising from the now. Thank you all. in your piece that you wrote and I, it made me think about all of the connections that we have here and I see church friends and school friends, high school friends, college friends and even my husband is here. Thank you Jenna, for coming. Appreciate it. The collection that I picked out today from some of my writings is about summertime and those feelings that emerge from the summer. This first one is called On the Birth of Seamus Heaney. And Seamus Heaney was uh, the poet laureate of Northern Ireland. And uh, he was a 20th and 21st century poet. And uh, it was interesting that he wrote his first collection in his 20s. And one of his uh, poems is about blackberry picking. And uh, it reminded me of my experiences growing up picking blackberries at my grandparents. Every early summer week, when I was young, we traveled to the country near 
to pick a pot of blackberries. Wearing our rubber boots, we would run out, up the long gravel drive, out into the cow pasture, stomping through the ditches, scaring away the snakes. Once I got caught, hanging backwards on the barbed wire fence, trying to be greedy, grabbing all of those big and juicy fruit, my mouth and hands stained purple and blue and red. But oh, so good was the taste of summer and sun and dew. The scar is with me still. This next one is about a trip that I took with my daughter for her 21st birthday out to California. It was a great trip. It's called San Buenaventura Beach. Meeting my daughter at the edge where the sandy coast reaches far and wide into the Pacific, wide-eyed and wild, running between one life and the next, chanting with the sea lions, soaring with the snowy gulls, battling with the angry wind. We run together and then apart, opening our bodies to rejuvenation, expanding the mind to all that is and everything that could be. We fall on the blanket, our breath diminished, turning into soulful joy, meeting my child and giving the gift, a gift of freedom, a knowledge resplendent the kiss of womankind. <laughs> this is about a trip that I made by boat in the Louisiana marshes a long time ago. And it was great. It was down in Bayou de Large, south of Homer. So it's, this is a reminiscence about that time. It's entitled, Francis's Camp at the End of the World. The flat boat takes us down the narrow canals to the end of the earth. The swamp grass taller than our heads. We are in Bayou de Large country. Looking forward towards the gulf, the setting sun is big and orange, larger than the western sky, staring straight into our city eyes. No words are said, none are needed. Only the hum of the motor sings to us as we wind deeper and deeper into the Louisiana marsh. Minutes seem like hours until the steps and the stilts come into view. We climb up. The water is now our land. The camp is our sky, swaying to the beat of the incoming tide. <clears throat> About eight years ago, Joe and I took a trip to England and it was a great experience. And this is about a memento of the soul from being in Scarborough on the, on the North Sea. It's called the Seaside. Colorful flags wave overhead as we enter the fish and chip smelling of salt and vinegar, a clear day in Scarborough. Off in the distance at the top of the rocky cliff, a medieval castle stands in ruins, a royal fortress that still punctuates the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire coast. Vacationers for a day, strolling through the crescent, boats in the harbor, walking down, down the steps that lead to the North Sea. I am the only one that runs headlong into the cold, a sea that is surreal. Frightening, calm, and frigid, both energizing and healing. Frozen limbs hitting quickly. Take my picture, I yell. <laughs> a recollection that will last. A memento for my soul. Sharing in the holiday tradition of bathing. This next poem is um, 
about all of those wonderful times that we've had nearby. And this is about visiting New Orleans before Katrina. It's called Take Me Back. Take me back to the city that I love, riding again on the streetcar down St. Charles, the blurred vision of the South from long ago. On our way for a late night at the Camellia Grill, a group of college friends wanting the day to never end. Take me back to the quarter, to a time before Katrina, when we were free from worry, strolling the district, an art gallery or two, sitting high with a bird's eye view, watching the chefs at Emerald's. This last one uh, I chose, I wrote it about my granddaughter, Anna Claire. And uh, one day I walked in and she has low windows in her room and she was rolled up in uh, a beautiful blanket. So that was the inspiration for, for this song. It's called Cocoon Girl. Some might say that I am crazy, just a little insecure. Maybe all I need from you is some attention. I roll up in the blanket, fuzzy warm, covered in big pink roses. My eyes close as I find a cozy spot on the floor next to the big little window, dreaming of summer, a splash in the clear pool, catching mosquito hawks that alight on the lawn where mom hung our clothes so many years ago. I snatch barehanded a mosquito hawk and a lightning bug that flits in the dark summer sky. A cocoon girl for a brief moment in time, enjoying childhood, wrapped in innocence, happy and unaware of what lies ahead. Deal 
mostly with birth and death, except for the last one. It's just a few. So, I'll see. Okay? Okay. The first one is called The Birth of a Poem. Like a dusty morning. Oops. Sorry, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> Birth of a poem. Like a dusky morn, damp, slow, even sticky. Like a bathe in trouble being born. Words like a dessert on a plate, slipping out of position. Or a book you know is there, but just won't be found. Festering like a pesky splinter below the surface or a nagging thought in the back of your mind, an unremembered dream, or a sleep you can't shake off. There is a poem aching to be born. And the next one is called um, The Guitar of Grief. And the phrase came from another poem I had read. It was in another poem in New York told to just take one little piece of the poem and take it from there. And so that's how this one came about. The Guitar of Grief. The guitar of grief in my life plays music too painful to hold on to. Must be released, transformed, blessed, transformed. Why did they have to die, Ben and Brian? Both quiet kids, the kind no one really knows quite well. No acceptance within or without. Not accepted by peers, so not acceptable to self. Or is it the other way round? How did we fail? How can we learn? How to hold the grief, but move beyond? To live with the pain, yet not be bound? to be transformed by sorrow to save a life. Let the guitar be strung. Let the song be sung. Let the pain fade like the last faint strains of the music. Let the rhythm of life go on with new lyrics. inspired by uh, the surprise birth of our twin boys, three hours ahead of time. It's called Welcome New Love. February spring, morning mild as a caress. Sunshine illumines loose sprung grasses. Breeze bows budding blossoms, welcoming new life. Refreshing the earth after summer rains. God smiles, welcoming new life, delighting the family circle, blessing the human race, opening the heart of mankind. Babies do that. Welcome new life. Welcome Will and Steve. That was 1975. <laughs> okay. And the last is called Grand Captain Adventures, and it comes from a trip my husband and I took down the Grand Canyon uh, in 2009. It was uh, five days and four nights on the river. And what we learned was that um, travelers before us have given names to all of the rapids that go through. So you'll hear names, uh, names of the rapids. So here it is, Grand Canyon Adventures. From Texas, Hungary, Louisiana, Siberia, and Arizona, we came. Mothers and doctors, grandmothers and lawyers, dentists, teacher, architect, engineer, nurses, people in business, we came. The jovial, the brave, the seasoned, the amateurs, 
the fit and the fragile, the hardy and the foolhardy, we can. Adventurers all, we can. Seeking the secrets of Earth's greatest chasm, we came to the roaring waters of the cold-hearted Colorado River, untamed master of mountains over miles and millennia. On crafts framed of aluminum and pontoons of air, we soared and splashed and crashed through rapids with names like Sapphire, Turquoise, Emerald, and Little Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> with our skill-filled skippers and swampers, we overcame the challenge of the treacherous specter, where prop hit rock and we floated adrift. Forcing down the Colorado, at every turn we observed multifaceted monuments of schist and shale, sandstone, limestone, and lava, all chiseled by eons of time, where water, wind, boulders, and sand chipped and refined, strata uncounted. We were misty and toasted baked and drenched as we rafted rapids unknown back home. We surmounted boulders and ledges, ascending the heights to plunge into the pool at the fall of the elves. We too were molded and melded and colored by life on the river. Irradiated by sun and sand, we shivered through shadow in the long winding ice box in late afternoon, we gazed amazed at stellar configurations of southwestern skies, and we slept on sands amongst tamarisk trees. Yes, we the adventurers, we came to the great cavern, we flowed with the river, we met the great spirit, blessed by love and skill and friendship. We, the Wayfaring Friends of May, 2009. approaching with a wretched-looking animal on a chain, lumbering awkwardly behind him. I guess it could be a bear, a pitiful excuse for a bear. The animal's fur was matted and patchy. His size was not as imposing as he'd expected. In fact, the way he cowered made him seem even smaller than he was, and something or someone had taken a bite out of his left ear. 
Miklos handed Bastian the chain and an ancient tambourine before turning on his heel and retiring to his wagon. He'll be your responsibility, Miklos barked over his shoulder. Just another pitiful creature in Mikolas's world-renowned enchanted menagerie, thought Bastian. He gave the chain a gentle tug and the bear moved to follow him. Bastian had cleared a space for the bear in the rear wagon and had prepared for him a bed of fresh straw. He'd had to move his own meager pallet in order to do so, but he did not really mind. He fit snugly between the rickety cages which housed Miklos's menagerie and the tiny desk where he performed his required duties each evening. The bear took a moment to peer into the dusty interior of the bowtop wagon, then followed Bastian obediently. He collapsed into a heap in the straw with a low groan. It had been a long walk from the city. In the dim light, Bastian regarded the bear further. His claws were not curved knives, no, they were brittle and worn. His teeth were not gleaming and sharp, but had been filed down to inefficient nubs. There was no fire in his eyes, no. This bear would not strike fear into anyone. I should loosen the chain a bit, thought Bastian. He moved closer and cautiously placed his hand on the bear's neck. His fingers began searching through the thick fur. There was a faint jingle as he discovered the collar. It was a beautiful collar, exquisitely embroidered with pink, purple, orange, and golden thread. It was adorned with a multitude of tiny brass bells and a pattern of flowers and honeybees, surrounded by a vaguely familiar image of two bears. Between the two bears was embroidered the name Berlioz. Bastian looked into the bear's tired brown eyes and whispered, Berlioz. It felt good, lingering on each sil syllable, Berlioz. And Bastian was certain he noticed a glimmer of hope in Berlioz's eyes as he spoke. Bastian's days began at dawn. He gathered water and scrounged for food for the menagerie that depended on him. Mikolas the Magnificent's world-renowned enchanted menagerie consisted of animals Mikolas had stolen, bargained for, or otherwise acquired along his travels. Bastian was the sole caretaker of them all. There was a blind snake which Mikolas boasted in his booming voice was a most poisonous fellow with venom so potent it was capable of killing a man with a single drop but was actually very high strung with an unfortunate nervous condition. Bastian would calm him at the end of each day by holding him closely to his chest and lightly stroking his brilliant green and golden scales. The two-headed turtle was a popular attraction. Each day, jostling crowds surrounded the large bell-shaped jar in which they were displayed, greasy fingers pointed and tapped, disquieting the turtles both and leaving the glass smudged and smeared. Bastian soothed the proud creatures each evening by cleaning the glass, returning it to its proper shine. But the turtles most enjoyed when pa Bastian polished their beloved shell, leaving not a speck of dust. The bumblebee bat, for such a tiny creature, was nearly always hungry. He could eat twice his weight in scavenged berries and still be hungry for more, peeping and squeaking for one additional bite. And quite a bit of Bastian's time was spent tending to the strange and elusive winged mouse. Nicholas claimed the rare rodent had traveled the vast oceans from his home in a distant land when the diminutive creature was actually a common field mouse. Each morning it was Bastian's duty to attach a set of silken wings, like the wings of a sparrow, to the mouse using a goopy mixture of paste and beeswax. Each evening, after removing the wings, Bastian used a mustache comb to clean the mouse's fur of all remaining bits of paste and wax. While the mouse yawned and stretched and made a thankful purring noise. The shy little glass frog with his translucent skin which left his heart beating on display and the phosphorescent moth who emitted tiny glowing stars with every flutter of her wings, they just loved to sing, but only if Bastian sang along with them. And now there was Berlioz. The morning after Berlioz's arrival, his snuffling and grunting woke Bastian while it was still dark. Bastian peered across the wagon to the bear was, where the bear was sleeping. He could see the shadowy outline of his great mass and saw movement as the beast pawed at the air. He must be dreaming, mused Bastian, but of what he, he could not guess. Perhaps the bear dreamed of his days dancing at the academy from which Nicholas had purchased him. Something told Bastian, however, that those days had not been as luxurious and grand as Nicholas had described to him. The bear's ragged appearance and meek demeanor seemed to tell a different story. 
Bastian shuddered when he remembered Berlioz's torn left ear. He'll be hungry, thought Bastian as he pulled on his boots. Dust motes danced in the sun's first rays, just beginning to peek through the wagon's high windows, and somewhere in the distance the throaty call of a rooster signaled the start of the day. Bastian pat patted his vest pocket, where either his heart or the silver teaspoon which rested there gave a nearly imperceptible throng. Time to get to work, you lazy creatures, joked Bastian to the animals in his charge. The field mouse stretched and the two heads of the two-headed turtle yawned in unison. The bumblebee bat had already begun squeaking and whimpering for her breakfast. Bastian stole a look in Berlioz's direction, but the bear slept on as though he had not slept in days. After collecting buckets of water from a nearby creek, Bastian started a small fire to prepare for Nicholas's breakfast. He then searched the bushes and trees at the edge of the forest for berries, roots, or edible mushrooms. Nicholas had not given any instruction on what exactly to feed the bear, so Bastian hoped that the foraged food would suffice. Bears were so much larger than turtles and bats and winged mice, he worried, certain that he'd never find enough food to satisfy him. Bastian's breakfast would consist of a hard crust of black bread and a warm bowl of per porridge. He dropped just a few wild blackberries into his porridge, then carried it and the bucket of forged food into the wagon. He then set to work feeding the hungry menagerie. His breakfast would have to wait as he always fed the animals first. Bastian sang when he chopped and portioned out the parsnips, radishes, wild mushrooms, and blackberries. There were sorrel leaves for the turtles and an overflowing cup of juniper berries for the bumblebee bat. He then busied himself distributing the meals. Bat turned to the small table where his breakfast sat waiting. Sounds of satisfied groans and smacking of lips suddenly came from behind him. Startled, Bastian spun around, and there was Berlioz, wide awake, his snout buried deep in Bastian's bowl of porridge. The bear's paws dripped with purple berry juice, and his eyes were half closed in a state of delirium. So it's porridge you like, and berries, I see. Bastian hoped the bear had eaten his fill, at least for this morning. Nicholas had eaten a breakfast of porridge, rye bread, and a beautiful green pear he'd been given by a bashful young woman at the last village they'd visited. Bastian hoped that there would be at least a small amount of porridge left for him to scrape from the bottom of the pot, as his stomach had begun to grumble as well. Make him dance, demanded Nicholas. Bastian stopped short when he heard Nicholas's voice. He had removed the heavy chain from Berlioz's neck and replaced it with a worn length of rope and had just led the bear out of the bowtop wagon for some fresh air. He had no idea how to make Berlioz dance. Perhaps it had something to do with the old tambourine Nicholas had handed him along with the bear. Bastian absentmindedly dropped the rope and ran back into the wagon to retrieve the tambourine. He bent to pick up the old dusty thing. The bear, he gasped as he realized suddenly that he'd left the bear loose. When he hurried back outside, he saw Berlioz frozen to the spot where he had left him, looking sheepishly at the ground to avoid Nicholas's fierce gaze. Dance, Berlioz, the boy commanded in a less than commanding voice. Berlioz did not move. Bastian then gave the old tambourine a shake. The bear let out a groan and hefted himself onto his hind legs. Bastian shook the tambourine in a slow rhythm and the bear began to keep time, shifting his weight from foot to foot. Not quite dancing, thought Bastian, and he looks, well, he looks frightened. Why should a bear be frightened of an old tambourine? He certainly doesn't look happy, that's for sure. Hmm, needs practice, Nicholas said as he turned to busy himself with more important things. Bastian stopped shaking the tambourine and gave Berlioz's rope a gentle tug. The bear dropped down and sat at Bastian's feet. The bear and the boy sat for a while regarding each other. Bastian reached out a hand and patted Berlioz's shoulder. His fur was soft and warm. The bear closed his eyes briefly, then looked Bastian in the eyes. Would you like me to play for you?
Center, Holmes here in the Louisiana Poetry Project, Louisiana Literature, Mocking Arts Review, and other journals. She's also the associate editor of Mocking Arts Review. sprinkled stingily on lanes and byways. Its momentary luster, sheen of eau de vie, kisses the bristles of your dark brow. I forgive it for being ethereal and sweet, a wisp of fog, frost to hang on to. This is a wet, nostalgic place, so snow leaves aches. They're like those cemetery angels that can't help but wrench your heart a little out of place. This snow, ma chère, is made of jots of joie de vie. It's like the chicory that wakens coffee, teaspoons full of sorrow in the midst of our affairs. This poem is called Reading Owl Moon to My Niece at Night, after Jane Yolen's book, Owl Moon. Some evenings, shadows were enough to make dark wings on bare brick walls, like great hornets in the story calling child and parent into night. We followed as they trod through snow so deep you'd lose a boot in. They asked the questions grown-ups did. Who was it who said, who said who? You grasped the creases of my sleeve. I cupped the bottoms of your feet. Owls in the graveyard up the street would echo every who we made. Who are you? Who knows? Who cares? And who loves you? A seeker always looks for owls, we said, though tracks behind fill steadily with snow. She knows it's not too soon for winter's cold. In the woods, the perched one listens from her place high in the pines. She crosses the path of the moon silently, two wings at a time. From a city girl to Hanshan, somewhere on Cold Mountain. I walk among mist-saturated trees that are luminous. At the edge of the field, I stop to watch egrets float across the field white banners signaling a truce with summer. The only mountains here, old friends, are bales of hay clouds drifting above. Their casual pace is a meditation mirroring my own efforts at peace. Oh, Hanshan, how did you leave the city behind? Did you miss it when you fled to your mountain? Or did you bring a piece of it with you, a lump on your back, lugged along in a sack? It wasn't all peace for you poets back then, like it isn't for us today. You sang the old songs you learned at court in backwater bars. We sing the ones we know in taverns and dance halls. Last night in the rain, I was missing home. But then I heard the hum of those little tunes you once sang to an audience of crickets visiting your tiny room. I'm humming along tonight to a calico cat and three dozen katydids. I sit at my own dark desk and write a rust sack of my own of my home earth, keeping company on the floor beside me. way to read a triptych. The weeping boughs spring back from right to left after snows. The wine saps you know will not stay barren. You'll see, they'll soon be burgeoning. 
the barn door will not list on its solitary hinge, not if you read the heart the way the ancients did. In two foods orchard, trees are always in full, always in full flower. Fences glare with new rails, sharp and white. Memory is that road that leads from winter to spring. Forget those lands where books are read another way. In our east, triptychs lead from decay to gloom. This is the order of things in the garden, after all, and not a petition for how things ought to be. Uninhabitable to him as I have tried to the cats who shit in my mulch. <laughs> Why do the ants still live in my walls and the wasps still nest in my bricks? Why do weird worms consume the leaves of my cannas and banana spiders spin webs across my porch? These are all deep questions as deep as those I ask at night in bed. How will I live if he leaves? When will I forget him? And who, little frog, will I love? African American Oratory, 
and poetry. And also I will include one of my first original works. An excerpt from the Montgomery story, the be first, a speech given by the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. on June 27, 1956. Then a reading of the poem, Mother to Son, by Langston Hughes. And finally, Chains, inspired after seeing a black man shackled for transport the very first time. The Montgomery story in excerpt. We will make some mistakes. Yes, we might even fumble the ball, but for God's sakes, recover it. Teamwork and unity are necessary for the winning of any game. In this area, it means that every segment of the Negro race is significant. It means that the backfield must realize that they need the people on the line to make the way clear. So away with our class systems. We have come to see that in this struggle, Aunt Jane, who knows not the difference between you is and you are, is just as significant as a PhD in English. That we will come together and work together. I assure you that in the next few years, we will be able to carry this ball of civil rights successfully across the gold mine. We will stand before all the members. It will be a great team. Let us unite. Let us keep moving on towards the city of freedom and equality. Let nothing stop us. Let us keep moving. Let no obstacle stand in our way. If we will do that, when the history books are written in future years, historians will have to say, there lived a great people, a black people who interjected the new meaning into the veins of our civilization because they had the courage to stand up and press on for the pressing values of freedom. And when we do that, Whenever we, as a race, whenever men of goodwill, and forgive me, Dr. King, and women <laughs> strive to do that, the immortal God will sing together, and the sons, okay, Dr. King will spin a little bit in his prayer, and the daughters of God will shout for joy. <laughs> And on that day, then Dr. King paused and gave this gift to his beautiful wife, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, on her first Mother's Day. A poem written by his good friend, very controversial friend, Langston Hughes. Mother to son. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no Christmas day. It's had tax in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor. Bad. But all the time I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. <clears throat> so boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit, excuse me, we that bit. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find this kind of hard. Don't you fall now. But I still going, honey. I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stay. Thank you. And 
actually my first, my very first original work. Well, the one I was brave enough to present, okay? <laughs> Chains. I heard it first. Then I saw him. A black Samson. Shaka Zulu. Matt Turner. Joseph C. K. Stretching his hands out before him as in a hopeless prayer. Yielding as I watched the silent free escape from his defiant body. Sound of the chains masking the click, click, clicking of the locks. Wrist, waist, then feet shuffling towards the abyss. Found once again. Freedom burning within his psyche, buried deep within. He still feels the motion of the ocean. The horror of the middle passage still lives. Thank you. Titled, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's Love Got to Do With It? It turns out more than I originally thought. On January 1, 2015, when I took a box of letters down from my closet, I had no idea the journey those letters would take me on. Nor does the character in my play, Lynn, when she finds a box of letters in her husband's closet. We never really know where one event, one action, will lead us, even though we are the director of our own lives. In Take Down the Letters, a play that emerged from that box of letters, three women from three generations explore themes of love. Starshine's love is young and confused. She yearns to be in a relationship and at the same time craves freedom and hasn't figured out how to do both. Lynn meets this young woman through the letters, and it turns her life and her understanding of her relationships upside down, at least for a while. And Joyce, Lynn's mother, is invited along on her daughter's journey, which deepens their relationship too. This writing project became a work of fiction with a direction and life of its own. The themes and characters changed over time, as did my understanding of them. The director and actors and technical staff are bringing a life and energy to the play that encourages me to look at it in new ways. I am understanding that all of this is love. Love for ideas, for creativity, for exploration. Each person involved brings a bit of their understanding and hopes and longing into the play. I'd like to quote Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist. He writes, when we feed and support our own happiness, we are nourishing our ability to love. That's why to love means to learn the art of nourishing our happiness. He continues, understanding someone's suffering is the best gift you can give another person. 
Understanding is love's other name. If you don't understand, you can't love. That's from How to Love by Thich Nhat Hanh. There's also the love from my friends and family. I'm quite overwhelmed that my brother and sister-in-law and five friends that I've known since elementary school, a long time ago, are traveling to Louisiana from California to see my play and to show me their love and support. After listening to an interview that Christy, Christy Lichty, the director, and I did on KRVS, my younger brother wrote, quote, so much I don't know about my big sister that the interview brought to my attention. What a process. I was struck by his use of the word big sister. I don't think I've ever heard him say that before. And an excerpt from an email from my niece, who is also a writer. I volunteered to read my story out loud at the book launch as an opportunity to, fix, to face my fear of public speaking. I want to be fearless like my Aunt Sue. While I don't think of myself as fearless, I do take risks, work hard, seek understanding, and recognize love. And now for a short scene from Take Down the Letters, our actors Sally Hamana and Katherine Schmidt. I hope 
that little taste inspires you to come to the performances They're next weekend, Friday, Saturday at 7.30 at Cité des Arts and a sun Sunday matinee at 2 o'clock. And we have some postcards here as reminders. Thank you so much. Give it up for Sue and the actresses, actors who portray. That, that concludes our first session of uh, Work Well 2018. Thank you so much for coming out. Yeah, so don't forget, if you want to continue with us, the next venue is Sola, down the street, and uh, the old hotel building in the atrium. There are t-shirts and hats for sale, volunteer list if you want to become part of Word Crawl Festival Awards. Thank you again for Carpe Diem. Let's hear it for Carpe Diem. Please buy something. And thank you all. We hope to see you for the rest of the day. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for all the volunteers.